Good morning. How are you doing? My name is Ben Cathy, and I get to be the pastor here at Hope Church. And uh, we're going to jump into our message in just a moment. And I'm a little gimpy today. I have an old man injury. <laughs> they say you can't steal bases, and I tried to steal third base. And uh, I didn't commit to the slides, so I have a sprained ankle. And uh, there we go. And uh, somebody said, you know, it's a sin for to steal stuff. So that's why you got yourself hurt. And that's why the ref called you out also. But basically, it's Jason Williams' fault. So uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's my fault. My fault. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's good to be here today. You know, it, it, today we're going to talk about God's church. And we've been in this uh, series called Faith Experiment, where we're inviting you into a place of action, into a place of movement in regards to your faith. And we've said that there's a, a, a subtle difference between belief and trust. That that belief often happens yesterday, it happens in our head, while trust happens today and it happens with what we actually do and say in regards to the kingdom of God. So the title of today's message is, when you say you believe, but you don't have faith in God's church. Now I, I just want to say that I have staked my life on the idea that God uses his church to bring God's kingdom to earth. That God uses his church to introduce Jesus Christ into our lives, into our friends' lives, and into our community. That God uses his church to save souls. And so I'm I'm pretty passionate about this subject. Uh, But I I just got to ask you, do you think God's given up on his church? I, I really don't. I really don't. And, and it, sometimes it's easy to say, well, 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 church doesn't matter that much anymore. In fact, there's this conversation that goes around in our culture. Well, well you, know, you know, I can be a, a believer and not go to church. And my answer to you would be yes, absolutely. You can be a believer and not go to church. But then, then I might ask you another question. Can you be a follower of Jesus Christ and not be engaged in a local church? And, and I would say, well, maybe. Because it's, it's harder. We need a family to belong to. We need to be part of the work of the body of Christ. We, we need to recognize that we are living stones being built into a holy temple, as Scripture would say. As we approach this topic today, I, I just want to say that in, in Scripture, it, it appears that God's church, and what I mean by that, it's not a, a denomination, not an institution, not Protestant, not Catholic. What I mean by that is that God's local church, local communities of believers gathered around the teaching of God's word and the breaking of bread and caring for each other and witnessing to Jesus Christ in our life is God's plan A for this world. And that there's no plan B. And, and guess what? Tag, you're it. Like, look around. You're God's plan A. And I hope that scares you just a little bit. So, so let's take a pop quiz real quick. Let's, let's see how smart you are. What is church? Number one, is it an event on Sunday mornings? Number two, is it a group of people? Number three, is it a place with a building? Number four, is it all of the above? And just for a little bit of accountability here, I want you to turn to at least one other person and share what your answer is. Just real quick, you don't have to. All right, good job. Hey, here's the good thing today. Everybody got an A plus. Because no matter what you answered, you got it right, okay? Now, I would say that if you answered number four, you probably got an A++ because the church is a lot of things. And, and sometimes I think we can get caught up in the language. We'll say, well, a church is not really a building. Oh, yes, it is. I have a building called a church. We'll say, well, the church isn't the church service on Sunday morning. Oh, yes, it is. I mean, we're at church right now, right? But you know what the church primarily is? The church is primarily a group of people who are called together around the cause and the purpose of Jesus Christ. 
to do his work. To do his work. But let me say this. No matter how you answered, I think we need to recognize today that the church is full of human beings. Full of imperfect human beings. Full of sinful human beings in need of grace. In need of forgiveness. Full of human beings with different talents and skills and abilities. Full of human beings that are so amazingly diverse and different. The church is full. And sometimes I believe because the church is full of human beings, we struggle with church. And I want to say that even though church is God's plan A, it's one of those things that's really, really, really important in our life. So it's sort of like our family of origin. And and that thing can be an absolute disaster. It can be one of the worst things in the world, or it can be an absolute disaster blessing and the most amazing thing in the world. And what I want to invite you today to do today is take a step to help make God's church one of the most amazing things in the world. But let's touch on quickly how it gets messed up. Because I don't want to ignore that part. But I do want to spend the dominant part of today talking about the beauty of God's church. But God's church gets messed up. God's church gets messed up when its leaders get disassociated with with a personal relationship with Christ. And and the ugliest manifestations of that is what I'd call bad pastors. And what I mean by that is that pastors who, who misbehave, and we've heard too many stories of pastors who have had secret affairs or who have stolen money or golly, I hate saying this, but it's true, or have moonlighted as as pedophiles or on a lighter note have asked their congregation for a $54 million airplane. And I would say that bad pastors get in the way of the church. There's a call and it's a significant call and there's a burden and a responsibility when you're a pastor or when you're on staff at a local church. You see, um, for every $54 million plane buying pastor, I believe there are a thousand, because I know them. I know the ones who have messed up and I know the ones who haven't. I believe there are a thousand that are quietly and with integrity leading groups of people to do God's work on earth. I like to think I'm one of them and I pray to God that I'll maintain integrity before you and before God. I'll never forget sitting in a, a committee meeting one time when, when a pastor on our staff team had messed up and one of the wise members of our committee said this. He said, number one, except for the grace of God, there go I as well. And, and we need to recognize that. Number two, he said, God will not be mocked. And I think we need to recognize that as well. And as Christians... We need to remember those two things, except for the grace of God, there go I as well. And we also need to remember on the other side, God won't be mocked. Bad pastors give us struggle. Consumer mentalities give us struggle. Let me me use this phrase. Our postmodern, pluralistic, narcissistic culture treats church like a Walmart where we go to get consumer goods and services, we leave, and when we need a little bit more of the goods and services, we might come back. But we don't take that step to be involved as part of the family, as part of the body of Christ. I believe that's one of the reasons we struggle with church. It becomes, in that sense, very plastic, not real it becomes corporate. And sometimes churches champion that corporate aspect and they get a lot of people in the room, but all they're doing is showing up. You know? Churches, cultural trends can help us struggle with church. It's not easy to choose to go to church these days. It's, it's, in fact, it's harder than ever. Church doesn't dominate Sunday morning anymore. Church doesn't dominate the weekend. Sunday's not a day of church and rest anymore. Sunday is a day we're invited to do everything else in the whole world. And sometimes that's how we spend our time. And we don't, we don't, you know, we have, I saw, I see garage sales on Sunday morning now. <laughs> we, the Little League is open right now, y'all. It's open right now because sports are more meaningful than being here with us. That's what, when we choose that, that is what we're communicating. Even when we have a prayer before the game. Let me be a preacher for just a minute. 
When we have a prayer before the game, we're not communicating that we're Christian. We're communicating that sports take a higher priority in the kingdom of God than coming to church. Okay. All right. I said it. You can write me a note and complain about it later. Some people leave church hurt because they're human beings who misbehave. And and, and I hate that. And I know that, that I've been part of that before accidentally I've never intentionally hurt anybody but because we're humans folks fall through the cracks folks can be a be the recipient of gossip folks can be ignored I hate that I hate it sometimes folks at church are hypercritical sometimes I think people think it's their job you know the spiritual gift of criticism (laughs) it's not in the bible by the way And they just get hypercritical and they just sort of like, the place just becomes thick with that spirit instead of a good spirit. I mean, mean, you know, when we go to lunch and instead of having a conversation about how good it was to see so-and-so or wasn't that a great celebration that that Michael shared in the giving talk or or man, I I really, you know, we go to church and we say, well, you know, the music was too loud or the music was too soft or the music wasn't new enough or it wasn't old enough or we had it wasn't trendy enough or we didn't, you know, we missed the word on the screen and, and actually we just become critics you know well you know the the staff people you know um the staff and the people that host team they're not friendly enough and I don't really like red shirts anyway red shirts are a little aggressive I think we should have blue shirts and 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 we're just too corporate we're we're too slick we're too casual we're we're not right we get really critical and people get critical of sermons too you know they do sometimes and usually they get critical of a sermon if you did something else they didn't like I've been doing this a while y'all that's how it works. It's like you did something else. They're like, I know, where, I know where to get him, you know. And so they'll come to you. They'll be like, you know, your sermon is too long. Your sermon is too short. You tell too many jokes. You know, there wasn't enough Bible in there. There was too much Bible in there. You know, it wasn't relevant enough. It didn't fit my theology enough. It, you didn't have enough personal stories. I mean, you really need more illustrations. You had too many illustrations. You shouldn't have shared that illustration. You didn't use anything from the original languages. Did you even go to seminary? I vented earlier, and I'm going to vent one more time, and it felt so good. One time a person came to me and said, your sermons aren't homiletical enough. Do you know what homiletics is? You don't even know what that is, do you? That's the study of preaching. Y'all, that is about like going to the Atlanta Falcons and saying, you're not football-y enough. They're going over the Braves saying, you're not baseball-y enough, you know? So somebody came up to me after 930 worship and said, you're a little too preachy today. <laughs> that was funny, wasn't it? I mean, if they wanted to say exegetical, hermeneutical, biblical, whatever. But here's the thing. Don't come to me and criticize a sermon with a big word and you don't even know what it means. There are places for honest feedback, right? There are places for evaluation. There are places for constructive criticism. I'm not saying that. But hypercriticism gets us nowhere. Well, I say I think we struggle. I mean, we struggle with being hurt. We struggle with our culture. We, we struggle with being hypercritical. We, we, and you know, we struggle with, with megachurches. I just heard this theme over and over and over again. If you're not part of one, you think they're evil, you know? I've just heard like good Christian people say, well, you know, so-and-so megachurch is just all about the blank, you know. I haven't experienced that. But it's pretty much a theme in our culture. And, and sure, there are bad megachurches. Let, let me share. I saw a meme on Facebook not too long ago. It said this. It was a picture of Southeastern Christian Church in Louisville. It is a ginormous church. I've been there. I've met the staff, okay? It's a ginormous church, but it says, and under the picture of the church, it says, because this is more important than feeding the starving. And I can almost guarantee you that church has done more for the starving than the person who wrote that has, like by a million times over again. But that's not the point. So the comments under the meme, like here's one, open your wallets for God, gross. Here's another one. I swear to you, I think it is a church that is here in Louisville. We call it Six Flags Over Jesus. 
And so I decided to chime in, you know. I love God's church. I feel called to God's church. So I decided to defend it. So I, I chime in. I say, there are great good and not so good and gross mega churches, just like there are great good and not so good almost everything else. Some of these churches spend all the money on the show. Others do amazing and incredible work around the world. The church is beautiful when it works. It's my little Facebook sermon. To which somebody named Nisla replied, Ben Kathy, unfortunately, more often than not, the church doesn't work and is run by corrupt individuals. Hmm. I don't share that. I don't share that to say that Nisla is a bad person. I share that to say that, that, that I recognize that there's a, there's a hill to climb here. And that there are valid reasons to not have faith in God's church. But I don't believe for a minute that God's done with his church. And I don't believe that God wants us to be done with his church. In fact, I believe that God wants us to closely follow Jesus and engage with God's church and do ministry through God's church. And as much as I have the ability to do that, I want to lead us to do that. I believe that God's church is plan A. And that plan A is intended to be an absolutely beautiful thing. Those perceptions are real, aren't they? In Matthew 16, we find one of two places where the word church is used in the New Testament. It's used 148 times in the New Testament outside of the Gospels. I'm sorry, the Gospels. The church word church doesn't appear in the Old Testament. I think maybe it's because that's the word synagogue in the Old Testament. It doesn't appear in the Old Testament. And in the Gospels, it only appears two times. One is about problems the churches have. But I want to share the other one. It's instructive to us. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you say, who do people say that the Son of Man is? That's, that's Jesus, the Son of Man. Who do people say I am? Those people. Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the other, in other words, they, they're saying all kinds of stuff, Jesus. And then Jesus asked the most important question of the faith of the church. He looks at them. He says, he says, okay, but who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn it from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. See, Jesus is Lord of the church. You know what the church is built on? Peter. Is that what Jesus said? The church is built on Peter? The church is built on a person? Nope. If we look at this, I think the way Jesus intended it, the church is built on the confession that Peter made that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. When Jesus is our Lord, God builds God's church. That's plan A. There was a, uh, a pastor who was invited to be part of the president's pastor's group. You've heard of that on the news every now and then, haven't you? And I won't share the president or the pastor because that'll distract you. But he tells about how he was invited to go to this thing in Washington, D.C. and how he was so enamored with the power just 
you get out of the airport, they pick you up, they put you in the limousine, you're driving through the streets of Washington, D.C. There's this federal building and that federal building in the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. There's, there's the military, there's the legislative branch, there's, there's the FBI. There's, and then he gets ushered into the Oval Office to sit down with the President of the United States for an hour where the President has a conversation with those pastors asking for their feedback. And he leaves, and I was just like, man, I have arrived. <laughs> I can really change the world now. But the second time he went back, that feeling dissipated a little bit. The third time he went back, that feeling went away a little bit. By the fourth time he went back, he said he realized that with all the buildings, with all the power, with all the money, with all the military, that that president and everything that that president could control and command and do, that that president couldn't change one single human heart and couldn't heal one single human soul except that that president be a follower of Jesus Christ and he recognized that he was a pastor in the church of Jesus Christ and that the church of Jesus Christ was God's plan A to bring the kingdom of God to earth and to help every human soul find eternity in this life and in the life to come. And that the church was the answer not the government of the United States of America. Some of you, that's the only thing you needed to hear today. <laughs> hey, I follow politics. I think we should vote. I think we should have an opinion. But politics won't save us. In fact, I'll tell you this. If we end up with a culture of people who are far from God and disassociated with God, it won't matter whether we're capitalistic, socialistic, communistic, or some other hybrid that we make up. Thanks for listening. The word for church in the Bible, the Greek word is ekklesia. It wasn't originally used for a church. It has two parts. Ek and klesis. Ekklesia. Ek meant out of and klesis meant to call. So the word church originally meant to call out of. It wasn't used for religious organizations. It was actually used for secular groups that gathered around a cause or a purpose. It was originally a civic purpose. A church could have been the Boy Scouts. The church could have been a club that picks up trash on Saturday afternoon. The, the church could have been a motor, motorcycle club. But when God's church formed, Jesus became the emphasis in the center of the church. And the definition of the church is that it is a group of people who are called out of this world to gather around the cause and the purpose of Jesus Christ. And it can be absolutely beautiful. Things can happen here that don't happen anywhere else. There can be a level of grace and love and compassion and life transformation that can't happen anywhere else. In fact, that's our goal. And sometimes all the stuff gets in the way of that. But we can never be distracted from the goal. At my first church, I was also the youth pastor. I was also the secretary. I wasn't the janitor. Yes. And I was not the choir director because they couldn't trust me with that. And we did have a choir and I did wear a robe after it came in the mail because I had to order one. But at my first church, our youth group, it wasn't real big. It was six, eight to start with. We grew to like 15 folks. Yes. But you know what happened? Kids found Jesus. I remember a, a kid had came and, and it was over in Temple, Georgia. I mean, I had some kids come from some places back in the woods around Temple, Georgia. 
Like they thought professional wrestling was a real sport, you know. <laughs> and I remember little, 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 one little guy, he was about 150 pounds overweight at 14 years old. But he was interested in Jesus. And, 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 we, and, and I shared Jesus with him. And during that time, he developed his relationship with Jesus Christ. And he started to become a disciple. And I remember one time going out to Stone Mountain. We took a group out to Stone Mountain. And we're going to walk up Stone Mountain. And I didn't think ahead of time that half my youth group was 150 pounds overweight before we went to Stone Mountain to walk up it in July heat. And I got to tell you, I took about two and a half hours to push those kids to the top of the mountain. We'd stop and rest and go a little bit more. And they kept saying, I don't know if we can make it. But I want to tell you that they made it to the top of the mountain. And I can guarantee you that some of those kids to this day are still telling their friends and family, they made it to the top of Stone Mountain. And that one kid, Perry, he's an adult now. But you know, to say thank you, he gave me one of those trophies of grace that and it was this little uh, glass praying hands. I would never buy that for myself. It's just not cool. But it's glass praying hands. And that's a, that's a trophy of God's grace. It's a trophy of God using God's church to work in somebody's life. How are you investing? And sometimes we get stuck on the big deal. That's a big deal. I had a youth group of 15 people. By the world's standards, it wasn't a big deal. By the world's standards, I was wasting my time. Not by Perry's standards. I, I'll never forget Larry. Larry, uh, Larry came to church as a, a, an adult. He told me when he walked in the door, he said, I haven't been to church in 25 years. But I believe. Well, we worked on Larry becoming a follower. During Larry's first few weeks at church, he it came to a place where he accepted Jesus Christ. And we were meeting in a middle school at the time. So he started to be part of the unload load team and then about six weeks later he asked me to baptize him and I did whoop, whoop. we were out in the lake and um, we baptized Larry and, and his faith was growing and then one day we got the trailer pulled up to the door with all the stuff in it that goes in the cafeteria so that we can have church in the school building that's now a church building on Sunday morning which is still legal in the United States by the way and I go out to his truck and I back it up and then I don't put the brake on and then I walk outside and I'm like, where's Larry's truck? Somebody stole all our stuff. And Larry's truck had rolled all the way across the parking lot and went through the wall of the gym where the high school boys worked out during the summer to get ready for football. The truck was mostly halfway through the wall and the trailer was right behind it. When the policeman showed up, he just laughed. He said, what happened here? And I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> That was Larry's antique truck too, y'all. I wasn't like, I mean, ouch. I said, Larry, I, I think maybe the devil's testing our relationship, testing your relationship with God's church. <laughs> and he said, yeah, you're right. I'll talk to you next week. Um, Larry forgave me for that. We became great friends in ministry. Larry served in the church in many different ways over the years. And when it came time for me to step away, Larry walked up to say goodbye and there were no words. There were no words. Because neither one of us could talk. We had changed the world together, y'all. I gave him a hug. He gave me a hug. We patted each other on the back and we still couldn't talk because we're men and we were not going to cry. So we walked away. I had a couple of contacts with him over the years and then about a year ago, Larry died. 
I couldn't make it to his funeral, but I called his wife, expressed my condolences, and and she said something to the effect of, you know, Ben, we both know where he is. Thank you. Y'all, God doesn't do that at the motorcycle club. God doesn't do that at the ball field. God doesn't do that. I mean, maybe he does it at work. Depends on where you work. Do you know what God's plan is? God's plan is to do that through his church. This is a place where folks who are far from God come and join a family. The Bible tells us that there are three images that describe the church. One is that we're, we're a family. That we're, that we're the family of God. That we each have a place. That's why it is correct if, I, if we say brother or sister. I know, I know sometimes we think only either redneck churches or church of God do that. But it's actually very theologically and biblically correct to say brother, sister. Because we're the, we're the family of God and we all have different gifts and we're all an important part of the family. And every person is called to do the work of Jesus as part of the family of God. There's, there's not a place in scripture where we're supposed to be separated from the family. We're supposed to give up on church and go do it on our own. No matter what it is. And so I, I got to say this. If you believe in God, but don't have faith in God's church, let me gently say this. It might be because you've never applied yourself to being part of the family. You've watched from a distance, tasted from a distance, and maybe criticized, but you actually haven't gotten involved in the family. That may mean being baptized, that may be, mean joining, that may mean just not standing in a corner and waiting for people to walk up to you, but walking up to other people and getting to know them. The church is also the body of Christ, where every person has a gift or a talent, where you see the video when we started that the hands were the hands and feet of Christ, so we each have a thing to do. And when we don't do it, the church is left wanting. And so maybe, just maybe, maybe if I've lost faith in the church is because I haven't asked God how to serve him. And I'm sitting around waiting for somebody to serve me. The church is also, we're, we're a group of, of living stones being built into God's temple. <laughs> a living stone means that I'm intentional about my relationship with God. It means that I'm intentional about my relationship with Christ. It's, it's not something that happens to me. It's something that happens through me. Are you investing in your relationship with God? Or are you expecting me to do that for you on Sunday morning? Ooh. That was good, wasn't it? We should quote that and put it on social media. <laughs> I'm kidding. Let me end with this. There's so much more I could say. I'm not in the least bit passionate about this subject. I have not invested my life in it. It is not, you know. We got a lot of myths about church. And, and, and I hope if nothing else happens today, I can help us move out of at least one of these myths into what I believe would be God's desire for the church. So one of the myths of church is that we just go to church. God's desire, though, is that we are the church. One of the myths of church is that it's all about law and rules. God's desire is that it would be about grace and forgiveness. One of the myths is that it's all about religion, while God's desire is that it would be about a relationship with him. One of the myths is that it's a place where we go to consume religious goods and servants. God's desire is that it's a place where we go to produce them for a world that is far from God. 
it. One of the myths is that it's about attendance. God's desire is that it's about involvement. One of the myths is that it's about what I get. God's desire is about what I give. A myth is that I come and I take something. God's desire is that I receive something. A myth is that it's a duty. God's desire is that it's a privilege. I was in the airport one time. I was literally in the restroom. And the loudspeaker goes, We have a chapel service at 10 o'clock in the chapel if you need to fulfill your religious duty today. I was like, I'm not going to that. Worshiping God is not a duty. We're, yeah, anyway, and I was in the bathroom, so I had the duty. Uh, but <laughs> a myth is that we're supposed to be good. God's desire is that we have to be holy. A myth is that church is about a building. God's desire is that it's about people. A myth is that we beg for money and maybe we do. I, we try not to. God's desire is that we teach about giving. A myth is that it just happens at church. God's desire is that what we do happens out there as well. A myth is that we're reactive to the culture around us. God's desire is that we're proactive. A myth is that we're inward and we just care for each other and God will use that. God's desire is that our inward spills over into being outward. A myth is that we're stable and secure and we should never take a risk for the kingdom of God. God's desire is that we take risk and that we try stuff and we're not always successful and if we're not failing every now and then, then we're not trying enough for God. A myth is that our church is for members. God's desire is that our church is for the world and the community and that the members give the church to the world and the community. If this is your church, then give it up. It's not yours. It's God's and God wants to do something special with it. A myth is that it, we're hypocritical. God's desire is that we would be forgiving. A myth is that we're judgmental. God's desire is that we would be discerning. A myth is that it's all about a sacred style. There are still people in America today who can't get over what we do on Sunday morning or the fact that I would wear a yellow t-shirt to welcome in spring and I have no idea why it was on clearance for $5.99. I mean, who wouldn't want this color, right? God's desire is that there's a sacred message that goes beyond the style and that it's the message that we attach ourselves to, that it is the work of Jesus Christ that we attach ourselves to, that we make the desire of our heart that God would come to earth and use us literally to bring more of God to this place so that eternity might begin today in our life and the lives of others and that folks might live with him for eternity. I hope that's helpful. You want me to keep going? (laughs) That's a horrible question, isn't it? I'm done. I'm done. Y'all, it's a privilege. It is a privilege to get to lead God's church. It's not perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But we're God's plan A. Let's lean into him. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for Hope Church. God, part of what we thank you for is that we're just one of billions of churches around the world, Lord. But God, let us do our part, God. Just as soon as we think we're big time, we're not, God, because you're big time. And so, God, let us lean into how you would would use us, God. God, where we need to ask for your forgiveness for our perspective and our lack of activity, God, we, we pray for forgiveness. God, we also pray for encouragement, God, where where you where we've been tempted to, to just throw in the towel on church, God, we pray that you would, you would enliven our spirit and show us where and, and, and how to take a step forward, how, how to belong, God, recognizing that it's not perfect, that it's messy. But God, we ask you to come into our lives and to use us to come into the lives of others. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand.